You're listening to Creep Geeks Podcast. So it begins again. Welcome back to the Creep Geeks Podcast. Season 6, Episode 236. Unpopular Zach Baggins, Ghost Adventures Paranormal Thought, and Quartz Crystals, Nature's Magic. Yeah. So here we are again. I'm Greg. I'm Omi. And we're going to talk about stuff that we think is interesting, and you will too. Okay. That's not a promise or anything, but you know. (laughs) Yeah, your results may vary. Okay, so in this particular podcast, we talk about all sorts of stuff we find to be interesting. A lot of it's on the internet, and a lot of it's just basically opinion that we have derived ourselves. Opinion and and observation. There you go. So. Of things that we find to be interesting, typically about the paranormal, the supernatural, the mystical. Sometimes woo-woo, right? And this is probably going to be one of these times. And sometimes just funny or weird. Yeah. And occasionally controversial. <laughs> Mainly to us, though. I think we fight about it more than... And we don't fight about it, but we, you know... Yeah, That's right. right. we got a ring set up in the front yard. <laughs> yeah. An octagon. <laughs> and Omi's powerful. Oh, really? Yeah. You're like my neck. Oh, great. Okay, so anyway, we have a lot of stuff we're going to talk about. And this is kind of something that we sort of came about through just sitting around looking at stuff you know watching tv and junk like that because it's it's cold yes and it's been snowy and weird and icy and as you know sometimes it's just uh better just to stay home and this winter's been kind of hard i mean i've never felt cold consistently for this long so, yeah yeah not a fan Mm-mm. All right, so if you want to contribute to the podcast or if you have something you'd like to share with us, we do have a toll-free number that you can call and leave us a voice message. And that phone number is going to be 575-208-4025. Yeah. And also on our website, uh, website creepgeeks.com, we have a, a, a web seat. A web seat. On our web seat, uh, Creep Geeks. Pull up a lawn chair. That's right. <laughs> um, we have a link on our website, creepgeeks.com, where you can actually click and submit some contact information and basically it's something you'd like to share. Yes. I think it says contact us on it. Yes, it only took me an hour to make that button. And you did good. Yes. Good job. A long time ago. Yeah. yeah. You're like, what about Comic Sans? I'm like, no, no Comic Sans font. <sighs> so. Anyways. Yeah. Some people get really worked up over that, right? Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, before we kind of roll into the podcast, we, we would like to say thank you very much to the people who have voted in the Paranormality's Favorite Podcast of the Month contest. For us. Yes, thank you very much, guys. Yeah. Don't know who or how many. I know I myself voted for us three different times because you're allowed to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, back in the olden days, I mean, people were like, you should vote for other competitors. and then but, you know, No, it's 2022, and the past couple of years have been crazy. No, <laughs> I'm not doing that. You know, it's like, hmm, <laughs> kind of is what it is. But we do appreciate it, and we'd like to thank all of our Patreon supporters as well. Yes. It's been good. Okay, so let's roll into a couple different things here. Um, our 4T in term of the day is something that we like to do okay. to explain things about what we're going to talk about. Okay. But one of the things that I think is most interesting about when we do our podcast is what we're going to have for dinner after we do the podcast. Because <laughs> I think that's, that's good. To, I like it because we sit down and do the podcast, and then we have a delicious meal afterwards so it gives us something to look forward to at the end of the podcast and hopefully it'll give you guys that are listening an idea of what you might like to eat after listening to our podcast unless you're on lunch and you're eating a hamburger or something right now then you've already got it figured out yep so what is our after dinner uh podcast dinner how's it it didn't make much sense how is our creep geeks after podcast dinner going to uh consist of or what is it how about dinner after the show that's just not descriptive enough. <laughs> yes, it is. I need to say Creep Geeks a lot in our podcast so that if there is an algorithm listening, it'll know that we mean business. And that we eat dinner? 
Because you know how that's going to backfire? The internet doesn't care. It's just going to feed us like food ads instead of like feeding people Creep Geeks podcasts. No, because when you're in the audio realm when it comes to the podcast, not so much just being an issue. recommend a bunch of cooking because podcasts. The algorithm does think, listen, no, no. The algorithm does things differently. It looks for individual words it can search out and use as keywords, and it also looks at phrases, phrases and phraseology. Mm-hmm. So what are we going to have for dinner? We are having TikTok ramen. Stir fry with steak and noodles and extra garlic this time. Well, that's not what I have written down here. Yes. You well, have changed the menu? It is TikTok ramen. Okay. Mm-hmm. And if you don't know what that is, um, maybe I'll find a link and share in the Facebook group, which is Creep Geeks Facebook group. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. No, I don't know if it's going to taste as good. It is. You know it is. Because as soon as you saw the TikTok, you shared it to me. And, and we've been having delicious... TikTok ramen. Well, it's not actually TikTok. Here's the thing. You know, it's not actually TikTok ramen. It's the way you're supposed to make ramen. There's two ways to make ramen, right? And we're talking about the noodles, little 12-cent deals, you know, or people, college kids, whatever, man. Ramen, right? And there's other ramens as well. So if you're like the ramen police, don't come at me going, well, you should be. It's like, look, dude, who are we? No. As I What's say, the difference quietly, between because I know there's more than two ways to make ramen. So and, I, and types, <laughs> just basically noodles, right? We're making like noodles. So you can do it the soup method where you add a bunch of water and you cook everything in the water. And, right, and then you have whatever ingredients you have in there. And then you add a flavor packet. And then boom, there you go. That's ramen noodle soup. Mm-hmm. Now, if you want to do like a ramen stir fry, you cook it with the water, then you pull the noodles out and you put it in a pan with all those savory ingredients and you mix it all together and it becomes infinitely better than the soup. Yes. But there is a drawback to doing it that way. Mm -hmm. You have to use more of the 12 cent packets of ramen noodles. Yes. Which I know they're like 26 cents, so don't come at me. But in my day, they were like nine cents. You could buy like a million of them. They're like 24 cents now a piece, but if you... They still do the deal where if you buy the big package, which we did the last time. There's like six in there or something. Yeah, so it does eventually get back down to that like 1990s price. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. They did a thing a long time ago where they said like, this is when Michael Jordan was still playing, actively playing uh, basketball, that his, like, what was it, like an hour of his salary could pay for every college kid to have ramen noodles all year or something dumb <laughs> like that. Like every college kid in the U.S., it was some crazy, uh, probably made up factoid thing, but I yeah. thought that was uh, pretty funny. But so anyway, we're gonna have that. Mm-hmm. It's gonna be delicious. Now we'll, we do like to have a, a term of the day, like we were talking about a minute ago, to kind of bring us into the podcast, and that term is piezo electric. I'm glad you said it. Because that's I why I said it. Because yes. you would say like pizza electric or something yep. like that. <laughs> and so piezo electric is basically electricity, or it means electricity resulting from pressure and latent heat. Yes. So, there we go. It, this will become clear as we talk about one of our subjects. But uh, we do have some news. We talked about this many times in the past. I think it was like three or four times. Every time one showed up, we talked about it. Do you remember what that was? What? You, you're looking right at the notes. You should. This is where you go, <laughs> yeah, of course I remember what that was. Yes, I do. Yes, it was the mystery monolith. Yes. Right? Remember these monoliths kept popping up? They had one pop up and, you know. And we first started reporting on, like, the one that showed up in Colorado. There was, there was one, one in, in Scotland. There was one in England. There was one in. New Mexico. Yeah, the one California. in New Mexico got beat down. Yeah, the one in New Mexico lasted all of, what, a day? I think it was like three days. or four days yeah. and somebody took it. So, this apparently is a new mystery monolith appearing near Phoenix. And we, you can find this article on Coast to Coast. And an unexpected throwback to a craze from a few years ago. I could have sworn it happened during 2020. Or I think it 20, did, too. Yeah. But maybe it just um, seems like it happened years and years ago. It doesn't to me. That's how long these I, years have gone by. I Seriously, I was like, wait, didn't this just happen? Yeah, it was like 2020, because yeah. we were all locked down looking for s- stuff. Anyways, so. a, a mysterious monolith has appeared at a scenic overlook near the city of Phoenix. The out-of-place piece is located along Highway I-17, at a spot known as Sunset Point and was reported to Arizona television station by a viewer last week. For those who have may have forgotten life before the pandemic, mystery monoliths were all the rage during following the discovery of the first such object in a remote remote corner of the Utah desert in November 2019. Oh, so... Yeah, it was, okay. it was Utah. Yeah. 
Um, the intriguing piece captured the attention of the public over the next few weeks and into the start of 2020, and a plethora of the odd objects began popping up in locations all over the planet. We even had one show up here in North Carolina, in Morganton, North Carolina. Of course, it was, um, it was uh, 13 inches tall, but it was shaped and modeled just like the ones found out in the desert. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, like most fads, the monoliths exited the zeitgeist nearly as quick, quickly as they entered, since the world soon had more pressing concerns. Um, however, it would appear that someone out in Arizona did not get the proverbial menu, memo, and the peculiar pieces being placed, um, a thing in the, I don't know, oh, sorry, <laughs> I totally misread that, um, yeah, so I guess they're trying to say that nobody got the memo, and this is supposed to harken back to those ones pre-2020. Well, I mean, you got to yeah. take an old story like that that was a flash in the pan. It was interesting for a minute and sort of kick it back up again since yeah. we haven't known one. But anyway, I thought it was kind of interesting that it popped back up again. And really, something like this deserves about 20 seconds worth of thought. You know, like, huh. Because you know, it, it was found out that it was a an artist that was making them and things and yeah. putting them out and now, here's something that uh, Arizona Department of Transportation is bringing up regarding this particular memorial and something I wanted to mention about the Southwest. Arizona and New Mexico in particular, if it's determined that it's, you know, not just some sort of mysterious monolith, but an actual memorial uh, or like like a grave marker type thing, then they'll reach out to the individual who placed it, and most likely it'll get to stay. However, if it's just an art installation, then they'll probably ask the person who put it up to remove it. That's nice. Yeah. And, it, you know, because, like, in Arizona and New Mexico, you have, like, a lot of um, roadside memorials, like ghost bikes and little pieces of art to commemorate someone who passed away on that stretch of road or someone important. And those are kind of cool. It's kind of... Part of the Southwest that's neat. You can just be on a long road trip and see something amazing pull over and just turns out to be a memorial. Yeah. Yeah. Because art, it happens. Yeah. (laughs) (coughs) But this one, it just, it's funny. I'm trying to watch the video and it just looks like a silver post. So. Yeah, I didn't even watch it. Yeah. I'm like, okay, you know, it's, it's neat, but. There's other stuff to worry about. Yeah, that's true. Which is the same thing that happened in 2020. There was other things to worry about besides... Exactly. Yeah. All right, so uh, as we all know, paranormal shows on television, um, they've been occurring for a long time, right? I mean, even if you go back to... Let's just go back to uh, In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy back in the 70s, right? Mm -hmm. Ancient Aliens has been around for a long time. All that sort of thing. But there's a ghost show that's on TV that people either love or they hate. Yeah. Now, the people that don't really, let's just do it like this. Uh, people who are not probably as serious about it hate it. Okay. And about the whole idea of it. And people that are, are not and who are in it for the entertainment value seem to like it. So come across an unpo- unpopular paranormal thought. Yeah. Basically, it's an, it's an unpopular thought, but in, in this case, it pertains to the paranormal. As I sat through watching a Ghost Adventures marathon while I was trying to work on something else, because we didn't have internet because of the weather, right? Yeah. Uh, it occurred to me that there is no other television show out there when it concerns ghost hunting and, let's just say, paranormal ghost hunting stuff in general than the show that everybody likes to hate and the ringleader or the leader of the show that everybody likes to hate, and that's Ghost Adventures with Zach Baggins and his crew. We've had this conversation before. Yeah, Yeah. and I like to stir it up every once in a while because sometimes, you know, you see organizations out there, um, and I'm using it loosely, and I'm not really pointing the finger at anybody we know directly. So if if you hear this and you get angry about it, and we're not talking about you. Nobody's putting anybody on blast right now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so these guys have provided more proof of ghosts and the paranormal than any other paranormal show, including, uh, and that includes cryptid investigation shows or team, period. I don't know. No, you you didn't let me finish. You can't sit up in there and disagree without hearing the evidential evidence that I have (laughs) loosely gathered from the internet. 
<laughs> right? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so if you look at Ghost Adventures, it's been on since 2008. Yeah. And we're in 2022. Okay. That's like, what, 14 years? Math. Yeah, it's a long time. And right now you've got Zach Baggins, Aaron Goblin, Billy Tolly, and Jay Wasley, or Wasley, however you say his name, and they investigate the scariest, most notorious haunted places in the world. Mm -hmm. Every episode, there's something going on. Every episode, they seem to get something. Right? Yeah. We've done ghost investigations, didn't get squat. We've done ghost investigations where we got a little bit of something and thought it was neat. And there's been other shows that have put things on television that they also did not really get a lot. Yeah. And people would say, well, that's because those shows are more real. Okay. Great. And I get that. But I kind of think it's like, well, then what's the point of watching the show? Because. <clears throat> and I'm going to use the idea. Hold on. That there are shows that do that, and they try to portray a more realistic way of investigating. But really, here's the thing. At the end of the day, how can you say that Ghost Adventures is any less realistic than the boring guys that don't use equipment or anything like that to go out and investigate? You can't. It doesn't matter, because if you compare them side by side, one gets results, one gets less results. Sometimes it flip-flops back and forth. But it did, really, who says that any way that these groups are doing investigations is the correct way? So that goes – but that – that goes back to marketing and entertainment in theory and practice because, okay, early paranormal shows, they hinged on the fact that half of their audience would be paranormal savvy or ghost hunters or that particular demographic. So they hinged a lot of their scripting or episodes along the precedent that people should understand that there's going to be a buildup. And while there may not be significant findings or evidence, like along the way of one particular episode, you should continue to watch in anticipation that the, the group would eventually find something paranormal in general, no matter how small the result. However, our society and our culture has come to that point of being uh, instant gratification click watch result so that's where ghost adventures took off whereas other tv shows like you and i were talking about how boring like we went back and tried to watch some of the original ghost hunters and it was like geez i have sat here for 18 minutes and nothing has happened right you know so well and and, and here's the thing i think part of that is is the methodology that these groups are taking when they're doing investigations yeah right um and then when you, you know, you looked up like ghost hunter, or when you brought up like ghost hunters and stuff like that, I mean, let's look at ghost hunters, right? They were around for a long time. You had ghost hunters international, then they just sort of died out. And then they came back with like ghost nation and all this other stuff. And guess what? Same boring shows. Now they've sort of taken <clears throat> members from ghost hunters international and ghost hunters and come together and brought taps back together, which is, was it the Atlantic paranormal society or whatever it is. Mm hmm. To, to bring in and do more investigations. One of the things that I always had an issue with with those ghost shows is that they weren't innovative. They weren't. Yeah. I mean, they rarely used, I mean, they used the basic stuff that you're supposed to use in investigations. But when it seemed like there was other paranormal groups and, and other you know entities out there selling ghost hunting stuff, that they would seem to get more results. And see, that's... Now, hold on. You could make the argument, though, that since they're using things and... in in, in the effort to hunt ghosts, right? Mm -hmm. And you're getting results that are they really getting results or is it just that they're you're, these devices that they're using are giving you something and so people are just assuming that that's paranormal activity. And it's really not doing anything at all. That's an entire YouTube wormhole hole that we should do a different episode on. No, I know. But so I was going to back up there and basically say that's – that harkens back to like some of the ghost and paranormal shows that I did appreciate, like, um, like Ghost Lab. I really liked the the those Texas Brothers, where they had where they were bringing equipment and they were using skills. But you're a nerd. I'm a nerd. We're geeky. We would appreciate those types of shows. It, it didn't have the audience. It didn't last, even though it brought in that new technology. Another show that did fairly well was uh, Ghosts of Morgan City, and it had, like, Ben Hansen, and it had Katie Stafford. He develops paranormal gear. But all of them are missing 
one of those little elements, whether it's ghost hunters, where it seems just too drawn out and not enough, uh, I don't know, pursuit of the paranormal. I don't know what it is. It's like they're not. It's boring a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it kind of <laughs> yeah. is because the. But with with the other shows where it was something I was really interested, like the, the equipment used for paranormal investigations, those shows also, some not always, were missing little elements as well. And there's some current shows that miss those elements as well. Like the stuff we watched the other night. I'm like, and Ghost Adventures fills all of those little elements all those little needs well i mean i would yeah. i would even go to the point to say that since ghost adventures and zach baggins they're quick to bring in equipment and try it out and yeah. use it and the results they get they're always blown away by which gives you that level of enthusiasm and people or gives them a, a level of enthusiasm that a lot of people say is fake and everything else right but it's kind of interesting right yeah and they seem to be genuinely excited by anything that they get no, I mean, whether that's real or not, I do think a lot of the enthusiasm that they have is real. Yeah. You know, but it does draw the sort of ire of other groups that are like, well, I do this and I don't act a fool like that and everything and so- else. But see, here's the thing. <laughs> and they don't get, but they don't get results. Because if when we go out and do investigations, who do we investigate like? Ghost hunters. Yeah. Methodical and boring. Yeah. You know, what does Zach Baggins and those guys do? They scream, they run around, they yell, they provoke stuff. Yeah. And since they provoke stuff, when they do provoke, they seem to get results. But see, that's and like, okay, if you were to, if I was conducting a paranormal investigation and you start running around like Zach during my investigation, I'm going to pull you aside and have some words for you. Yeah, but why? Because that's where, okay, if somebody is running up and down the hall screaming demon, demon, you know, or just possibly putting themselves and my equipment in danger because they're running through the dark, that can also taint any potential collection of evidence. Because if this person's but just... you're not getting any evidence. That's the whole point. <laughs> I could be. Maybe. But when you go through 12, years of, or 12 hours of footage and find out you don't have anything at all... To counter that, if I'm going through four hours of footage... And three of it is somebody running through the hallways, screaming, and I hear something else. Is it is it actual paranormal evidence, or is it they moved further down the hallway so it doesn't sound just like the scream I heard a few seconds ago? Don't don't so, cock your head at me like you got some kind no, of point. That's because here's the deal. <laughs> what if the reason why they're reacting is they're reacting because they got something that happened to them? You know, how many times have you heard or seen in some of these ghost shows, right? Oh, I just got touched. And they're like, oh, I'll calm about it. I'm yeah. like, oh, yeah. I'm, come on, man. If a ghost is tapping on you or scratching you, you, sh- you should react, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, I just got scratched and I got three scratch marks and that's the Holy Trinity and the mocking of the... And they're all calm about it. Get out of here. <laughs> I mean, if I'm in a ghost hunting place and I get scratched or pushed or all that stuff, we're leaving. Okay. Or I'm going to react to it, mm-hmm. and I think that the reaction that these guys have, I mean, you know, sure, I'm sure some of it's over the top, feeds the energy of the room, feeds the entire thing, and they start getting more results. If you go in there like you're asleep and you try to hunt ghosts, guess what's going to happen? If everybody is correct in the assumption that spirits and the paranormal and everything acts and feeds off your energy, if you don't have energy, you don't get shit. Okay. Right. These guys, they go in there and act a little nutty, but they get results. It freaks them out and it keeps going and going and going. And I've seen a couple episodes where it's like when they were using like EM pumps and stuff like like, like this big giant EM pump in a room and crazy stuff was happening yeah. uh, to the point where even the most skeptical person there was like, oh, I don't know what's going on, right? That was entertaining. Okay. So I think part of my point is being missed and that is, Okay, we were watching a paranormal show last night where they were using a recorder uh, to get EVPs. And they were very excited by the results they thought they were getting. However, if I were listening to that evidence, what it sounds like to me, it sounds like a very inexpensive recorder is being rubbed up against a uh, mattress comforter, like a bed comforter or a pillow. Because when they were excited and asking questions... 
the recorder, the microphone, rubbed up against a pillow on a bed. Not because a ghost said something. Okay, well, yeah, I mean, okay, that, yeah. I'm not missing your point, and that yeah. completely happens. I'm looking at it a little bit differently, really, and that's one of the biggest gripes I have. If you use a cheap garbage audio recorder yeah. and you hear stuff and it is of low or substandard quality, the level of what is being said a lot of times is so low or so distorted or so staticky uh, but you you can't really make it out. And so it leaves it way open but, to interpretation. And the problem with that actually is, is that, well, I mean, I understand that it's really hard to get EVPs and it may not be something that you're going to be able to hear clearly. But when you are overdriving the speaker because it's turned up all the way and all you hear is static, you know, garbly mess. The excitement and the mistreatment of the equipment may be what we're hearing, not an actual ghost. Well, so yeah. Not conducting yourself in a composed manner during that investigation. Uh, let me okay. So, what you're saying is, is that if you go in there and you act like an adult <laughs> and treat everything perfectly, then you're going to get these great results, no. or that the results you get will be great. I'm saying the results in that excited state cannot be like accurately determined to be paranormal, especially if you. If somebody is so, so... So because they're so excited, yes. you have to immediately discount all their results. Not immediately discount, but I can't, like, I can't put them on the same pedestal as I would, like, evidence. That's great. Seen. I'm glad you brought that up. Okay. Because here's a list of what they've done so far, just off the top of my head, that they've actually proven time and time, and proven by actually showing, right, on yeah. their, in their episodes, and this is Ghost Adventures, time and time again. Mm-hmm. That a lot of these shows never even get it all. Okay. So, demons and demonic possession. Yeah. They get possessed all the time. So, I mean, you know, you can kind of like, well, I mean, I can see where, and honestly, I can see we're going into some places that you can be influenced by what's there. Energy, negative energy, whatever. I mean, it does have, but I don't know about being possessed by a demon all the time, right? Mm-hmm. Orbs. Everybody knows that orbs are dust or moisture and all that stuff, but there are some orbs that I've seen on that show that I cannot explain. Okay. And like, at all. Yeah. Like, that does not make sense to me at all. And then people will immediately write it off as being a bug. And it's like, you can't. You can't just Im- immediately dismiss it. See, and this is kind of where I'm getting. They have seen apparitions. They've had shadows walk by. They've seen all that sort oh, of yeah, thing. Oh, yeah, they've had some a good lot. ones. Yeah, like some And like, a lot of that shows yeah. up after what? After provoking and getting in there where, you yeah. know. And there was one where this little kid stuck its head out from around the corner and dug back in. And it scared them all so bad they hauled ass. Yeah. Which is a, a natural reaction. I think, you know, especially when you're not expecting it, right? Yeah. Um, so they've seen the apparitions. They've had poltergeist activity. We've seen that too. Watch that Billy Tolly guy. I think it was Billy Tolly who screamed like something a girl. Threw at him. Like, yeah, he took off. And, yeah. you know, I would do that too. You're in a quiet place, but okay. Maybe not as fast as he did or as high pitched as this girl, these <laughs> screams he was making, but still. Um, spirit communication. These guys communicate a lot and they use the ITCs, right? To go out there and communicate with things. And it seems like they've got some pretty good results. Now, most Ghost Hunter shows these days do. Get results as well. These guys are consistent. Okay. Ghost attacks with being scratched and stuff. There's been a couple episodes with these guys have been scratched. One episode, dude provoked and got scratched, and they stood there the whole time. So, yeah. like, well, that was kind of scary, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, they have the shadows and the vapors and manifestations that they've seen and captured. Standard equipment malfunctions, which makes sense if you've got an energy or uh, energy um, drawing spirit for example they, they do pull energy out of we've had this yeah you know it got to where i would bring like an extra set of batteries to where i would bring every freaking battery i own to go to one place and they would all be dumped yeah and it's like these are brand new they've been you know all that sort of thing right uh haunted objects these guys have collected haunted objects zach baggins has a haunted museum which right? yeah which when you say haunted museum who do you think of steve steve who barcelo Okay, oh. who? If you're a, uh, if okay, what? You think of Zach Baggins, okay, and his haunted museum. Everybody does. I mean, we know Steve, and that's why we think of Steve. But anybody else who doesn't know Steve is going to know who? Zach. Yeah. yeah, and Ghost Adventures, right? They're going to associate the one and the same. So that made the museums popular. He started collecting haunted objects, and people are like, yeah, he bought a house that says haunted. I can, you know, whatever, it's fake. I, I mean, I'm not going to spend fifty thousand dollars on something if I don't think it's real. Yeah, right. And then here's something that that all the stuff that they have done and repeatedly and showed up and right and presented in the public viewing world 
these popular shows, has made all of this more popular. All of it. Mm -hmm. And there is not one show out there that has the same sort of reach or draw from what these guys have done to pull people in. And that could be a good thing or a bad thing. If you're a serious scientific you know, researcher, investigator, you hate them. Because they're getting results, and you're like, well, that's not the scientific method. It's scientific method. And at the end of the day, nobody knows who they are. So it's kind of like, how do you want the field of study or the whole idea of just the paranormal investigations and ghosts and all that sort of encrypteds and all that? You know, how do you want that to move forward? Because one of the complaints is there's not enough people doing this. We would like to see more people get in the field. We would like to see. But then when you have people that come, into that field or want to be a part of it. And they're drawing what they know from these popular television shows and things like that. And they try to go out in the field and do it. What do these people that want the more people to show up do? Close ranks. They close ranks and yeah. dump on them for coming to them because they've seen popular TV shows. Yeah. So it's like, you can't get what you want if you don't allow people to come in and they're basing the people that are trying to join these organizations to go out in the field and do investigation work are getting dumped on by the people that want them to show up because they're getting it from somewhere else because they disagree with the popular idea of a popular television show actually doing some good for the entire thing. So this is an unpopular thought that I have, right? Yeah. And, I mean, honestly, if it wasn't for a lot of these shows, a lot of people wouldn't be doing this. A lot of people wouldn't be looking out and going, you know, checking out Sasquatch. and everything. A lot of them would not be doing this. And yeah. so when you got somebody who can write a book, you spend out there investigating and get some kind of notoriety or popularity from it. It's not from them who have never written a book before. It's because of shows bringing the interest up so that people can kind of keep the whole thing alive. And, and it's for me though, it is a dual edged sword because, <laughs> um, like this particular area we live in Western North Carolina, there is a very rich culture of just um, weird, high strangeness, as well as paranormal activity, legends and folklore of cryptids. However, uh, I have been loosely associated with some tourism conversation with different regions here in North Carolina. And there is an overwhelming response, uh, like negative response, regarding paranormal tourism. And one of the first mentions out of it is, you know, Ghost adventures, these particular small towns or historic regions, they don't want what they see on ghost adventures to happen in their small town. And yes, that is the worst decision those small towns can make. Yeah, because most of these people <clears throat> that have this viewpoint in ideology when it concerns like things like paranormal, yeah. they're afraid that it's going to make their little small, closed-off community but look bad. They those. Because of how popular Ghost Adventures is, that's what comes to their mind instead of uh, like that Amy and Adam show that we were watching the other night where they went into a historical place and did the research respectfully and right. quietly. They don't think about those researchers, which is closer to what <coughs> they'll actually get if right. they became a paranormal town. You and, know? you know, and I get that. But a lot of the communities that, that don't want that kind of thing in their community are also the same ones that don't have anything in that community to keep the younger people there to basically yes, sustain they have the community. Many other cultural and social issues. Yeah. Yes. And so it's kind of like, okay, you know, the, in a lot of these communities are the same communities that don't think that the internet does anything. That's true. And so, and you know, and there are places, but I'll tell you a little secret. Most anyone who has a team, who appears to be somewhat serious about it and somewhat respectful about it can go pay the five hundred dollars and spend the night there. That that was the and, other and you know part that's the it. thing people are like oh well they got invited because they're so you know they're professional they yeah. gave them five hundred bucks and they signed an insurance waiver that basically said you break it you bought it yeah that that was the other part of it it was either you know oh well we'll offer it for a historic building on the outskirts of our town so you can't enjoy the rest of our tourism <laughs> yeah. or like on the travel channel, I would started to count how many uh, episodes of These Woods Are Haunted are based on the Blue Ridge Parkway without yeah. giving enough details. It's like, oh, yes, our region is haunted and has paranormal away from us. Yeah. <laughs> you so, get on that road and you just keep going. <laughs> and that's kind of like you know, the thing. And then when you go back to looking at like Ghost Adventures and stuff like that, the Travel Channel is Ghost Adventures. Pretty I mean, much, there's there's yeah. very few shows anymore that have anything to do with travel on the Travel Channel. 
Yeah. Right? I, I don't I don't think I can't off the top of my head I don't know any. Yeah. Yeah. The travel channel should be the paranormal channel. Or something like that, because it seems like they get more and then, and there's a reason why that, that channel that channel, right? Mm-hmm. Is doing that. They make money off of it. Well that's like but so the Travel Channel is owned by the Discovery Network. Discovery it is Network, now. Yeah, Discovery Network, years and years ago, this was a while back, also had bought some other channels. And one of them I was familiar with, with the name of Court TV. Yeah. And it did nothing but forensic files and American justice with Bill Curtis late at night. Then they pulled the numbers and realized those shows were doing real good. And well, yeah. that was the birth of murder podcasts because... yeah. Eventually, court TV turned into true TV, and now I think it's even something else. But they realized, you know, nobody's sitting here to watch court all day, unless it's like a, you know, like a very, very in the news court case. Yeah, it seems like a channel that does really well that's like C-SPAN. Yeah. So people are like, I'm going to watch our, you know, our nation's I mean, lawmakers. I mean, right down to the point where they weren't even playing a lot of cop shows. It was like the grisly stuff. Yeah, because, I mean, that's what yeah. people want. It's like, okay, so do you want... And, this and is I, foresee, sound, I foresee the Travel Channel eventually doing the same thing. Well, they've already started. Yeah. But, <clears throat> I mean, do you want to see a boring... <sighs> it sounds so so dark when you say it. Do you want to see a boring sort of uh, terrible thing? Or do you want to see, like, serial killers and, and sensationalistic things? Which one's going to get the ire, right? Which one's going to be in the slasher magazines that you see in the store, you know, that you used to see if you bought a yeah. magazine? from? And it's the same thing. You got Ghost Adventures and you got the other groups, right? Ghost Adventures is crazy over the top. You get results. Yeah. It's entertaining. The other one's not so much. And you know, and it even it's funny because if you watch their, their intro for a lot of their shows, it's like you know, in our evidence and you know, building their credibility, they have to feel like they have to put it out there. Yeah. Now, if you look back to two thousand eight, I would like to think that two thousand eight is the extreme when everything was extreme. You know, <laughs> extreme wrestling, extreme this, extreme Mountain Dew. Everything was extreme, and these guys showed up. Yeah. And they have sort of tamped it down a lot from when they first started. Because mm-hmm. they're older and they're wiser and all that stuff. But and at the end of the day. they can't like fall out of a two-story window. I mean, that was like the first episode I saw where they were like in like some tombstone Arizona ghost town. And they got scared so bad they fell out of a window. Well, and yeah. Now they're but, older and they can't fall out of windows. Well, you know, and that, and I think that part of it is, is that they're, they're, they have a better understanding of what they expect to happen or whatever. Yeah. You know, so that they're more hip to it. Because, you know, I don't know, say what you want. The unpopular thought that I that I think is out there is that Ghost Adventures and Zach Baggins have done more and provided more evidence of the paranormal than any other show out there. And if you think I'm wrong, that's fine. You can do that, and you can leave a comment somewhere. If you think Omi is right, that's fine. You can do that and leave a comment somewhere. But we're just kind of interested in what it is. Because or just write out a whole response if you want. Contact at creepgeeks.com or hit us up on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. We can just go to Facebook and say, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. But either way, it kind of is what it is. And I say this every once in a while because I do, when I've watched those shows, I'm like, you know, they have, they seem to capture... And not just in one episode, but in multiple episodes, all the stuff that if you're a ghost hunter, you would want to see. And you know what? I I just thought of something that I really do appreciate and respect about Ghost Adventures. Lately on TV, a majority of the shows are based on the East Coast. Yeah. Ghost Adventures, they're not based in California. They're based in Nevada. Yeah. But they do a very respectful job of hitting up a lot of the middle of the United States as well as the Southwest. Yeah, they do it less because I heard that Baggins doesn't like to fly. Yeah. Which for whatever reason, but you know. But, but yeah, he's he, yeah. He, yeah, they do it they do I mean for what they do They and do the Pacific Northwest, they do the Southwest, they do California. They've they do done the East Midwest, Coast too. They've, they've done, done overseas. Little, yeah. But the I really really like that I, yeah. because you know lately it seems like i'm inundated so much with so much this happens on the east coast or a location that is so east coast centric or east of the mississippi and i'm like you know there's haunted stuff other places too 
Yeah. Yeah. So. But it seems like, uh, you know, kind of going back to the community, if you have a community that embraces that kind of thing, it it seems to be more fun. Yeah. <laughs> it does. You know, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, there you go. There's an unpopular thought. So Zach Baggins and Ghost Adventures have provided more proof of ghosts in the paranormal than any other paranormal show or team. And then it also includes scripted investigations. Okay. Because if, if, if I mean, how many, let's just, we don't even need to talk about Sasquatch or Bigfoot. How many freaking blurry pictures do I need to see? Yeah. You know, these blurry pictures. I mean, you know, come on. Didn't they have the, the Travis Walton episode on recently? So they've, yeah. they've dipped into aliens a couple of times. They've yeah. Dipped and into they've, they've talked to people that are, you know, they've, Dave Schrader was on there. Yeah. Skinwalker Ranch thing. I mean, so, you know, they, they've done their due diligence, and they do. And they bring people in. And they're also quick to not bring people back that they felt wasn't genuine. They, they If you are disingenuous, you never come back again. Yeah. And I have seen where there's been instances where groups have spoken out, you know, at Ghost Adventures and Zach Baggins calling them, trying to call them out, and he's quick to blast them. Yeah. You know, <sighs> which – you know, right or wrong or whatever, but, and I think that one of them, he heard an offhand comment from ghost hunters saying something and he let them have it, <laughs> you know, and he, he doesn't do that often, but you know, I think that, you know, I don't know. It's, it's a thing. And I think they've done it enough where they talk about bringing spirits home with them and, and attachments and all that sort of thing, you know, and that's going to happen, I guess, if you get out there and provoke, but I mean, you know, Hey, whatever, man, it's all good because it's definitely more interesting to watch, but we'll see. Uh, because with the ghost hunters and bringing taps back and adding females back to the team and actually trying to use new equipment and things like that and having celebrity guests, maybe they'll come up with some better results. You know? Yeah. I mean, how long did it take them to actually start using other equipment aside from like recorders, cameras, and that's it? It's taken a long time. And then they, yeah. when they, when they brought some females back to their team, they started getting more interaction because like I, I've said this before. I mean, if you're a 18th century male chauvinist pig ghost, you want to talk to two <laughs> dudes, or you want to talk to a, a girl, yeah, which is wrong. It's male chauvinist, but I mean, it is what it is for that, for that time. But all right. So speaking of crystals, we need to talk about crystal power. It's <laughs> just that segue there. It wasn't even a segue. It was basically <laughs> like, I just turned the channel on you real quick. <laughs> So okay. this is something I was thinking about and have thought about for a long time. And for me, it spanned from when I was watching the ghost adventures thing going to, I have always wanted a crystal radio. Yeah. And I think I bought one one time and it didn't have all the pieces. So it didn't work. So I was like the hell with the crystal radio because the idea of using copper and like wire, you know, and wrapping it around a tube and adding some transistors and some crystal, like quartz crystal to it and being able to listen to the radio mm -hmm. science, man, I was blown away when I was a little kid because I wasn't allowed and wasn't going to be able to get the chemical set because I mean, some of those sets were dangerous and you even bought one from a thrift store. It had like radiological junk in it. Yeah. You know, so, so certain science kits were not cool with the crystal radio thing. As I, as I was sitting there, I'm like, I'm going to buy a crystal radio. And I didn't because I went on a tangent and started looking up this stuff too. Because you know I'm older and I am you know a little bit wiser, and I started trying to go. Well, let me see what the deal is with. The, and I come across a whole bunch of different things. Now, we don't want to skirt too too far into the woo woo, you know, which is like the metaphysical and all that sort of thing. Because I mean, you, you know, it's 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 a deep rabbit hole. And it, it gets to the point where it's like hard to follow because you would have to be completely immersed in this. Yeah, type of you, you thing. Had, I mean, you really kind of got to grow into this or grow up with this to get a deeper, you know, understanding. That's and why. I grew up with it, but I, <coughs> it's I a lot, strayed man. so far away because it gets to a point where any subject, if you become so engrossed in it and becomes a part of basically your daily life, trying to speak to someone. I hate to say that, uninitiated, you know, it sounds we call like, them the unwashed. It sounds like you are the crazy person. Yeah. Cause you are. Yeah. And so I, I grew up with some of this stuff and, you know, living near the Edgar Casey center and having relatives who are involved in, um, the research and enlightenment ty type stuff. Well, yeah. 
I was always skeptical. I mean, I believed in certain things, but for for the past couple of decade, decades, there's been some science to back up a lot of the woo-woo and the metaphysical, including, you know, like the whole crystal energy stuff. Well, okay, so that's why I put this in here, yeah. right? And, you know, if you really look at it, and there are people out there that go, crystals, whatever, they're not real. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Maybe more excited than I am about it, but you know, because I keep thinking when I get this feeling, I need some metaphysical healing. Oh God. Right. <laughs> but um. <clears throat> okay, so crystals are nature's magic. Yeah. They really are. And people will be like, "Well, you're just you know looking at it from a spiritual side." And that's not it at all. These things have physical attributes built into them that definitely warrant more thought. Yeah. And I don't know which side is which. I don't know if woo woo has claimed these crystals as part of their thing, or if it does have the, the properties necessary that it just makes sense. Because I had a couple weird ideas about it. And one of them was, and we'll sort of go into this in just a second, but, okay, so you know how they say that the, the poles have shifted and come out of alignment where the North Pole is not where it is, yeah. and they were worried about a mantle shift and all this stuff that really scare you. So what if there's the possibility that the Earth's, poles and mantle alignment is misaligned and has over time to the point where using crystals like quartz crystals to levitate lift power and all that sort of thing which is what a lot of people think they were that's what your people were using them for the ancient peoples doesn't work anymore and that's why as a whole we have a hard time making it work because you know quartz crystal is one of the most abundant crystals and materials on the earth period and they do have scientific properties. Yeah. Like, for example, quartz basically vibrates at 3,276, 32,768 hertz per second. That's yeah. the frequency that it vibrates or oscillates at. If you put quartz crystal under pressure, it creates electricity. It creates that piezoelectric effect. Huh. Right? Yeah. And it is... Basically, it has a just a ton of like for example a a you could store data on it right that's been the latest and greatest thing it seemed to hit the news like a quartz coin can hold three hundred and sixty terabytes of data for billions of years. Okay. And every science fiction show you ever watch right yeah. shows them taking a crystal out and putting it in the thing. Superman and put a crystal in the thing right. Everybody puts a crystal in the thing and it brings up all the world's information right. Yeah. Um. You know, with the quartz minerals, it's used in all of our electronics, right? The quartz, like for photos, computer circuitry, all of that sort of thing, right? Yeah. And there are just basically tons and tons of instances where quartz has natural properties that can be scientifically proven that makes them special. It's magic. Okay. And it actually ties into nature's other magic, magnetism. So what if all the crystal spots that we've had at one time, they were all over the planet, all got together and, and sort of acted together in an array, which caused you know, crystal power to actually be a thing for like levitating objects and building things and defense and communication and all that sort of back in the ancient times. And all that worked because it was easy to work because the way things were aligned. And if the mantle and the earth and all that stuff of the crust actually shifted, the poles shifted, it made everything misaligned, and now the crystals don't do what they used to do. So it's like off a little bit. It'd be like having a radio station where everything is crystal clear and you just move it a little bit so the tuning is off just a little bit and just goes static and becomes unlistenable so you don't even listen to that anymore. You just move on. But that, that whole concept right there is way heavier than just a radio station. You're talking about like like it, people who were alive at that time, their entire civilization and understanding of the way the world works right. is completely dismantled Exactly by a shift in... The poles. Yep. But I also am like, those people should be smart enough, or you would hope they had been smart enough, to figure out some sort of... To how to tune and calibrate it. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that if it, if this even existed all, that they were. They just got wiped out. Oh. And if it shifts too far, and you basically have a, a cleansing that happens where the earth decides to rid itself. In other words... Here's the second part of that. What if all that energy and everything that was there, right, was genuinely sort of set up to be positive and negative because everything is the equal exact opposite, the whole yin-yang, all of that stuff comes into play, right? So if everything shifted to the point where the crystals no longer worked, they went from positive energy to kind of a negative energy, and it 
Basically, at what point does all that negative energy influence everything to the point where the earth has to cleanse itself or reset? My millennial self is like, hurry up and reset. I'm not because it wipes everything out. I know, but having a very negative view or taint, slightly negative view of things, if we could have been so much greater, I'm okay with bring it all back. Easy, you know? Thanos. That's not how all this works. <laughs> I know. And I, I here's the thing. I think we were, and then something happened, whether it was through our fault or whatever. Everything got wiped out, reset, started over again, like with small tribes of man and all that stupid stuff. I think it's happened multiple, multiple times. Mm-hmm. Like I don't think that Atlantis was a mythical place. I think it was a real place because if you start looking at the land of Mu and Lemuria and Atlantis, mm-hmm. right, it all makes sense. And if you look at the way. Even Pangea doesn't make any sense anymore. Where the land mass is separated over time, and this is what we got for continents, we're missing chunks of stuff. Yes. So, and the Great Flood has been in everything and written in every culture's history since you can read whatever they left behind as far as their written or communicated history. It's all in there. Yeah. So the idea that we've only been around for 20, 30 years or 20, 30,000 years or whatever, that's garbage, man. Especially when you find a fossil that could be, you know, upwards of a million years old. Nothing makes sense. I think a lot of scientists over time have started warming up to the fact that, hey, the real secret is, is that we are not special. And having said that we're not special. Or the first. Or the first. And looking at the cumulative results of this current civilization, I'm like a little bummed out. So I'm not. Okay. We're just growing, going through some stuff. I know, but I've been just reading so much sci-fi fiction lately. That I'm just well, like, sci-fi fiction is great, but it's also the harbinger of the entirety of humanity sucks, and we should <laughs> all do better. No, there's there were some because com- you sucked. This happened. Right? I, I don't know. It, I've been comparing like everything we've just said to um, a book where pretty much a reset happens, and it's like. A reset happened on Earth, but it also happened on another planet within a very short period of time. And it was like a comparison contrast of how how good and how bad things could be. And I'm like, huh. In this particular book, Earth does really good. And the other guys did not do so good. So, but both civilizations were very conscious of the previous reset. And that was the difference compared to like what we're sitting here talking now. Yeah. There's no well, proof. It, there's no 100% proof for us, you know? Thematically, it's all throughout everything that we do. It permeates the culture. I mean, let me use another really simple example, Groundhog Day. Yeah. Right? Gosh. I mean, so I don't think that any of this is lost into the idea of, or maybe, maybe it is lost, but I think the idea of doing the right thing until you get it right is not just an idea. I think it's been firmly subplanted or sub It's been basically imprinted into our human psyche, even into our DNA. So that you never forget, so you always strive to sort of work on and create, create and correct okay. the conditions to sort of keep things thriving. Because thriving, if, it, if it doesn't happen, I think things get reset. And I don't mean reset as in somebody flips a switch and starts over. I mean like wiped out. And then it takes the time to build it back up to sort it all over again. That goes back to like, okay, you know, cementing and relearning these experiences until we get it right. The same could be said for like the whole quartz stone tape theory. Things are going to keep recording over and over and imprinting and over and over again until what? Until the quartz is full. Well, here's the thing though. Maybe, maybe the stone reset or the stone tape, stone tape theory really is just a byproduct of things being so misaligned that they don't work correctly anymore. It's a data loop that gets stuck over and over again because you need to defrag some stuff because you didn't treat the hard drive correctly, so it never got fixed, so all these bits and stuff that aren't there that should have been cleaned up and went away Or is can't. this, or is this right now such, such a corrupted data loop that the VHS is degrading right now as we speak? Sure, and that may take thousands and millions of years. Ugh. 
That's awful. So if everything is, if, if every, cause people will tell you, you know, you know, things are out of alignment. Well, if everything is out of alignment and the courts is, is not able to do its job because courts has healing properties and all the other woo stuff. And we, this is like, this is like international space station, look space station looking down on Helico- the planet. This is beyond helicopter This is beyond view. helicopter view. <laughs> so we're like a new, an 18 yeah. million mile view looking into the whole thing. Cause I mean, there's people that have spent, you know, their entire lives trying to figure out quartz and crystals and stuff like that. Yeah. And if these things, these quartz crystals and all the properties associated with the quartz crystals, everything from healing to data storage, to PZO electric effect, to, you know, isolating the harmonics to be able to lift and levitate and do all this stuff. If all that is out of whack because of tectonic shifts or mantle slip or the pole theory or the uh, poles being out of alignment, you know, there should be a way to correct it, but we don't know because we haven't been taught that because I think when it went out of alignment before, if this exists at all, it destroyed everything it would take to be able to do that. In other words, that knowledge becomes part of a lost knowledge. Mm. Because, I mean, how can you explain certain places that had, you know, geologically, the structures that are on them don't make sense and they're built to standards that it's obvious they didn't cut a brick or a slab of this rock and move it 10,000 miles. But it's, in other words, it was modern made even to the point where we couldn't recreate it. And you look at it and you're like, wow, this thing is like 50,000 years old. There's no way. Yeah. You know, because the carbon dating has even gotten better to the point where certain things just like, there's no way they're leftovers. Hmm. And there is no better um, example of leftovers than hate to say it, the Egyptian people, most of the Egyptian people that came into create and form Egyptians inherited things like the pyramids. They were there before. I don't know. They didn't build it. Mm. Not all of it. They built some stuff, but for the most part, that stuff, a lot of that stuff was already there. Okay. And they, they were nomadic. They moved into the area and they sort of duplicated building processes. Huh. So I don't know. And you got like, was it Pinapunku and all these places I can't pronounce that you see on uh, ancient aliens and stuff like that where, you know, they're not making that stuff up. They go and they look and they carbon date things and they're like, this is the results that we get. And people used to say, well, there's, you know, that's not right. That's impossible. Right. That's impossible. And it's not. And science is getting to the point where they have to sort of own it, own up to it and incorporate it into the idea of things, you know, like humanity humans existing at the same time as the other hominoid species that we were supposedly have grown out of or grown into from them. You know, it's like a progression of like uh, when you, to, to get to the modern homo, homo sapien structure, right? The, the form we are now, they'd say, oh, that's because you, you went from Australopithecus to Neanderthal to cro and all this stuff, and then you turned into homo sapien. And now they're like, well, wait a minute. Now it's common knowledge that like Cro-Magnons and Neanderthals or Neanderthals basically and Homo sapien bred. Mm-hmm. So they're around the same time. So how can you grow into it from a species as part of your evolution if you're already here? When I went to school, Lucy was like the oldest skeleton out there. Like this little monkey skull is what we all came from. And then what did they find? Like 200 yard or 200 miles away in another place was a fully formed Homo sapien. It's just the same. Like as you could have Died there yesterday. But you know what the answer to that is, right? What? Time travelers. Oh, God. Because people would rather believe okay. in time travelers than believe in natural history. Or re- history. Let's just call it that. Huh. Yeah, I don't know. It's just a thought. These are the thoughts I have when you're not around. You should be around for me to talk you to death time. <laughs> like now? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> that's all i got i'm uh i'm just uh replying to small town monsters uh regarding their kickstarter campaign so yeah we actually were a part of that and by a part of that we watched it while eating delicious chicken nuggets in a rainy parking lot because we don't have the bandwidth to support streaming it in our current domicile and underground bunker in western north carolina we have backed uh small town monsters two or three times i can't remember exactly as part of warding off your birthday, which seems to can cause issues. Like we've, we've had bad luck with your birthday as part of, we just need to realign this since 2016. 
my birthday has been a literal curse. We have had bad things happen every year since 2017. 2016 was the last good birthday I had. Well, 2017 wasn't bad. 2017 I had, we almost died in the desert. Well, no, we didn't. The ranger thought we were going to die in the desert. No, that was, no, 2017 was San Lorenzo. Oh, yeah, okay. 2016 That's was true. Quebrada's Scenic Byway, where the rangers stopped by and thought we were. 2016 was the last good birthday. 2017, we had almost died in Socorro. Yes. Uh, 2018, the state of New Mexico pretty much said I had to stay home. Yeah, you were super quarantined. I was super quarantined in 2018. 2019, we had two family members go into the hospital on my birthday. Yes. Um, what was that? That was 2019? Did I just say in 2019? Yeah. Okay. 2020, we all know what happened then. Well, no, we don't. Greg broke his neck. Sure and did. And literally like two, a twig. Weeks, two weeks later, the whole country shut, shut down. 2021, Greg had to have a whole bunch of teeth ripped out of his skull. <laughs> Now you make it sound like I'm some sort of toothless old fool. No. Just, no, it was basically two teeth. One on top, one on the bottom. And they're like, we can fix this for five grand. I'm like, I don't even need them. They're in the back. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah, so it's been a thing. So this year, your birthday is coming up. And if there's anything to report, we will let you know in our next podcast. But I we, have planned not to celebrate my birthday. We do, we do it later. With the exception of taking part in Small Town Monsters Kickstarter campaign. So And and getting presents mm, delivered to the yes. safety of the bunker. Yes. And working. I'll be working on my birthday, which is rare. So Yeah. Yeah, because I used to be very um very dramatic about my birthday. Like, no, I'm not working. I have the whole week off. It's all special Omi week. But no, this week or this birthday, I'm just going to pretend my birthday is very low key. <laughs> well, don't make it sound dramatic. I'm not. It's dramatic. I'm technically like sulking. So, yeah. Well, it's good. I'm glad you're keeping it to yourself. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, so you were responding to Small Town Monsters in the Kickstarter, which... Um, according to what was said by Seth Breedlove, the Kickstarter doesn't just end. It goes for a full month. So if you want to uh, support Small Town Monsters and all the movies that they make and the, the wonderful paranormal encrypted material that they have put out there all over the place, everything from movies to YouTube channel to all that membership stuff that you can do, and all of it's great. I like it all. You can certainly do that. We have included a link that takes you to the Small Town Monsters Kickstarter. There are multiple levels at different dollar amounts, so you don't have to go in there and and try to you know you you could whatever is comfortable for you you can do. Yep. Uh, this is like the only Kickstarter we actually support. I've supported Kickstarters in the past, and you know what I got from them? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Like I'm still waiting on this little pocket computer. Um. So <laughs> allegedly, doesn't exist anymore. Kickstarter has uh, streamlined some of their processes to better protect some of the investors. So I'm actually going to start looking at some other ones, but this is one flat out. Every every year we try to support them. I do want to say they hit their primary funding goal within the first two hours of launch, I want to say. Yeah. Like, yeah. By the time we got home yeah, they had from watching it. our live stream and eating chicken nuggets. But they have some very interesting rewards, including like DVDs of the productions they plan to produce in 2022 uh cool things like this year they have a hoodie or an enamel pin um, they have digital downloads if you're not a dvd person yeah. anymore a uh, film credit that's always cool so Posters. yeah and their their investment tiers start you know like 20 bucks gets you some stuff you even know? even less than that but yeah. yeah so but that's what we did as part of my birthday so and got game camera. Yep, that's the so other the Creep part of Geeks it. Critter Cam. Let's give you an update. We've done that the past three podcast episodes. We're gonna we're gonna keep doing it until we forget. <laughs> so, so uh, okay, we have a camera set up in the middle of the field. Don't tell people where it is. They'll come up and try to take you know. The obscene first, pictures. they'll have to get to the state of North Carolina. Then they have to figure out the general area we're in. You know what? It's possible there may be people listening to the podcast that actually live around here somewhere. I doubt that. It reminds me of a TikTok where this guy who's actually set up a camera trap using really expensive cameras and stuff to capture wildlife like birds. Mm-hmm. He goes and gets his footage, yeah. and it's just some portly man 
right, with work boots on and no shirt and a ball cap, doing like boudoir photography for his camera. <laughs> it was on TikTok. It was, and the guy wasn't being like weird or anything. It was funny weird. The guy brings up his footage and shows and sees this guy do, doing all the modeling for his picture. So the guy figured out the interval that the camera was snapping pictures and did different poses for him and just left. And so the guy has like, you know, a wonderful looking bird and then a, and a guy on a log doing like these different poses and stuff. And, you know, it was, it was actually really funny. And because the guy was like, if anyone knows who's, who this is, please, I need to get in contact with him. This is the best thing ever. So imagine you're surprised to see, cause the guy, it was, the camera was a really good camera. Yeah. Like a DSLR, not like these garbage trail cams that are out there. Well, it's we have the, some, some respectable trail cameras. I've set them up in certain spots through the property. I do want to say we have one that's been pretty much set up in the middle of a field and we'll get cute things like the foxes. Occasionally we'll get a raccoon. Um, recently we got somebody's cat and I don't know how that happened. Well, there's two of them. Yeah. The white cat and a black cat but or this, light this, and dark. It's yeah. hard to tell. One looks like a little tortoise shell tabby. The other is just an orange cat, turns out. But uh, they have to travel quite a distance to get here. So I thought that was neat. Um, I just looked at some of my footage. I got a uh, a deer. That was nice. So Yeah, we get deers. Uh, or deer, foxes, raccoon, crows. We've been sort of attracting some crows to... Crows are... Yeah. For a couple of days, they're pretty cool. When when it got very cold out here, uh, one of the cameras in particular wasn't doing enough video at night. It was getting these still images, and I attribute it to it just being so cold that the batteries, which were draining, got to the point where they weren't going to do video. They were just going to take pictures. So I was getting these strange images that just like this little black blur in the shape of like a cartoon mustache. Well, paranormal um, mustache. Yeah, paranormal mustache. Finally went ahead, replaced the batteries, plus we had some warmer, warmer days. Turns out that paranormal mustache is a skunk. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what is this? Did I find a new cryptid? I was super psyched, y'all. And then gave it three days. It's it's a skunk. Yeah. A skunk that does not care and has already struck once this year. Yeah. So, yeah. Skunks are... Uh stinky yeah so i'm hoping to get some other stuff uh the goal is is to take one of these these trail cams yeah and set it up near some stuff on our property that looks weird yeah so we've had bobcat in some of the previous updates bobcat foxes coyotes raccoons a skunk and the crows the crows are showing up um the the crows are kind of cool because they show up every day around between 7 15 or so and 7 30 they send one down one's the scout who inspects the area for food and then when he says that's enough he calls and then the other other crows come down and and start talking and stuff um and they don't like the bigfoot and the alien figure we have outside so they'll knock it over and then eat um and there is one that I don't know if it's the crow or not, who jumps on top of the camera and kicks the Wi-Fi antenna over, and I lose signal off and on throughout the day. So that's pretty interesting. So anyway, uh, the goal really is to capture some stuff, but at the same time become familiar enough with these these cameras to be able to use them and try to squeeze the best out of the garbage quality that most of these trail cams are. So if we go somewhere and set a camera up, we might be able to capture something interesting. Hmm. And that we can you know, maybe you know, a real paranormal mustache. Yeah, kind of funny. That'd be weird because if you imagine if you just just like this big furry paranormal mustache floating through the air and you record people would just they would not believe you. <laughs> They'd be like, that is not you know you just catch more hate. I think so. Anyway, I think we're going to go ahead and take a second to wrap up the podcast because we've been going for a little while. There are lots of things that you can do to help uh, support your your paranormal community and small business. You can do small town monsters Kickstarter. You can also find out. Uh, maybe through Facebook or something, some of these other paranormal teams and investigators and stuff, and maybe follow them on Facebook and, and talk or interact mm-hmm. with them. And you can do that with us too. Uh, we are on most social media platforms, so be sure to check us out. Uh, we're on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, a couple other places. 
like Greg was saying, support those other paranormal entities. Again, thank you to Paranormality uh, for putting us on their favorite podcast of the month. And vote for us for next month. Yeah. I want to remind folks, we have new stickers available. If you are a Patreon supporter, do not buy the stickers. They will be in the mail. Yeah, they're coming to you. They're coming. Um, But if you are not a Patreon supporter, you got two choices. You can either support us on Patreon, link to Patreon in the show notes for this podcast episode, or check us out on Etsy. Crafted Intent is the name of my Etsy shop where I have not just new stickers, but I also have some quartz geode pendants. Yes. And some Delicious other, jewelry and bracelets. Yeah. They are amazing. Some I mean, other witchy or witch adjacent as qu- quoting hex files pod. They like to use that word. Yeah, you're, you know, adjacent. your bracelets though, I mean, not to yeah. jump in there, but everybody that sees them has come up and was like, oh my God, you know, and I'm not just saying that because I'm married to you and I want stir fry. <laughs> All- no, seriously. It's like, wow, these are great. Um, all bracelets are either protection bracelets or they are protection and imbued bracelets slash talismans. So check out Craft Intent where I put a lot of energy into some of my my unique creations. Yeah. I'm not good at selling myself. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> here's how this goes, everybody, if you don't know. If you come across crystals that call to you and they're related in some way to whatever it is that you're doing, you should probably pick them up. Yep. That's how you pick. It's when you find a bracelet or whatever that really sort of speaks to you. There you go. Just be aware, though. Yeah, that can be good. That can be bad. Yeah. So. But anyway. That's a whole woo-woo episode we yeah, should do another sure time. Sure is. We actually got some stuff from one place that we went to, and by the time we got it to the car, it was not good. We're like, we left it. It's like we did not bring it home with us. <laughs> you know how irresponsible that is now that I look back on it? Well, you know what? It is what it is. So speaking of it is what it is, it is the end of this podcast. We'll see you next time. We do appreciate you listening. So see you later. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye.